Hi, every, hi everybody. Hi, and welcome to the Dry Needling Plus, uh, the, well, the Dry Needling webinar for tonight. It's great to have you all. Let me know if you can hear me in the chat room. You'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a, a chat room there. So let me know if you can hear me and see me all okay. Make sure it's all, all working okay. So where are you all from? We've got, got a good show at the moment. Sarah, William, Anita, Liz, Thomas, Damien, Chun, Paul, Lara, Tamara, Carla, Catherine, Declan, Peter. Lots of people rocking into the room now. That's fantastic. Great to see you all here. So, uh, so welcome to the dry needling webinar for tonight with Andrew Hutton. We've got uh, a webinar to start with where Andrew will be uh, talking about dry needling and then taking questions and answers, uh, questions from people that he'll talk through the answers to. And we've had loads of questions submitted from everyone uh, when you've enrolled, which is just fantastic. And uh, it's great that you could ask those questions. So we'll, Andrew will work his way through the questions after he's done his presentation, but you can put more questions in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got some, everyone can, can, uh, I can in, they're in the chat room saying they can all hear okay. So that's good, good. Uh, yeah, so Andrew will be answering questions after the, the first presentation, which is the, the webinar part. And so, yeah, you can put those questions in the chat room there and we'll talk through those as well. So the more questions, the better. And we anticipate this will probably go for somewhere around the 45 to 60 minute mark. And lots of great info when you hear about dry needling. So we'll, you know, who's done dry needling in the past? Let us know. Have you done any dry needling? Put a, a yes or a no in the chat box there. Let us know. So I'll introduce Andrew Hutton. Now, Andrew's a... Uh, physiotherapist. He's a sports title physio in uh, Tasmania. And Andrew's been teaching dry needling and acupuncture for almost 20 years. And he created the, the integrated dry needling approach. And it's a really nice combination of uh, techniques that work beautifully to improve range of movement and pain in your patients. And it's quite a gentle type of uh, style of needling. And it's a, the sort of style that patients will be happy to have, you know, for each of their treatments. I use it myself in the clinic all the time every day and it works beautifully and yeah, it's great stuff. So uh, so yeah, Andrew's gonna talk a little bit about the approach, how it differs to dry needling, and then give you practical tips on how you can, you know, uh, about how dry needling can be used in the clinic as well. So lots of good stuff and lots of good information from Andrew. And Andrew's down in Tasmania and he, uh, often travels up to Sydney and Melbourne to present courses on integrated dry needling. And we've got one left later in the year, which we'll give you links to as well if you're interested. Uh, but there's going to be lots of good content in this webinar. So we're going to hand over to Andrew now. I've just got to take him off, off mute. And uh, so we'll unmute Andrew and bring him on to the webinar. And this is all righty. I'll hand over to Andrew. We're on, Dave. Thank you. I think I'm on mute now. I'm live. Everybody hear me okay? I think Dave decided that my first two words were probably not worth listening to, so I think you have me muted there. Um, so I can completely give you a bit of a sound check there. Hear me loud and clear. So I see uh, Lara, who's done the courses there. Um, Zalinda, yes, you've been on the courses from the Gold Coast, I remember. Um, so good, the guys that have done the courses might have some different style questions to the guys that uh, haven't or are intending to do some courses. Um, so for those of you who don't know anything about it, it's integrated dry needling now. Uh, 
ch I changed the name about three years ago. It was DNP and dry needling, uh, myofascial dry needling for a long time. But we're now integrated dry needling. It's simpler, it's shorter, and uh, definitely, definitely shorter to write. Um, it's a different approach to dry needling. Many of us have heard about trigger point needling, uh, which has been popular and has been around for a long time. Uh, myofascial trigger point releasing and intramuscular simulation are quite, they're very similar, different names developed by different people, but pretty much the same technique. And they're out there, they've been practiced a lot. Uh, in the presentation, I'll give us a quick overview of those techniques or those approaches leading into why integrated dry needling is different. So um, David's passed on to me a lot of the questions that you guys have submitted prior to the webinar, and a lot of those questions will actually be answered in the body of the talk. I know this, uh, but uh, and any that aren't, I'll address. I'll address one by one during. So. Um, any, any more questions that come up? And I do hope that uh, Zalinda and Lara, people that have done the integrated dry needle courses, will have some questions that will show uh, show how people that are using the techniques are actually thinking. So, so those of you that haven't uh, haven't been in contact with integrated dry needling will actually be able to see the sort of angles that those folks are coming from. So. I'll, I'll get started on the presentation. It is, it is an overview. Uh, it's quite an old presentation. Uh, and these days in the courses, I don't really do an overview. Uh, in previous times, I, I felt it was necessary to give a lot of background on, on why this, this approach had developed. Um, now we just spend the time on doing good clinical stuff and assume that everyone's there for the right reason and um, there's no need to, to to discuss why why integrated needling is so different. So, looking forward to your questions. Uh, it's a reasonably short presentation; will be probably 20 minutes or so. Uh, and and do 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 prepare those questions. Okay, so we'll go to slides. We won't have to look at me uh, trying to maintain eye contact with the webcam any longer. Let's let's go. Okay. okay. So as I said, it's integrated dry needling. Uh, David isn't the only one that stumbles occasionally. It was DMP for a long, long, long time. Um, but uh, integrated dry needling now. <clears throat> so if we look at the, the trigger point needling approaches, we've essentially got Janet Travell and now Peter. Janet Travell came up with it. A lot of us have seen the the two red books, part one and part two, in a lot of practices that we've worked in, or perhaps we actually own them. Uh, myofascial trigger point release. In the 80s, physiotherapists in Australia were using spray and stretch. And in the early 80s, there were physiotherapists doing needling, but the basic standard for needling for Australian physiotherapists was a traditional acupuncture course. Uh, we weren't able to do shorter courses, and for some reason, um, anything other than traditional acupuncture wasn't recognised for physiotherapists. So it wasn't being practised to a large extent. Um, and so spray and stretch was, was the first sort of method used by physios to address the trigger point model. And then, quite separately, Chan Gun, North America, came up with the intramuscular stimulation model. Both of them use different, use different jargon, but essentially are the same technique. So the treatments with both myofascial trigger point release and intramuscular stimulation they're based on locating basically sore spots. You're pushing to muscle bellies, uh, the focal areas of increased tone or irritation. They make people screw their faces up. They may or may not have referred pain. And they're basically speared with a fairly heavy gauge needle. The needle's twisted, lifted, and thrusted, and the muscle cramps. And the idea is that when that muscle has an irritation caused contraction, that the stimulation of the Golgi tendon apparatus in the tendons relates, uh, results in a relaxation of the muscles. Now, it's always thought for those practitioners that to see the muscle actually do a strong contraction, to grip the needle, it's called the needle grasp phenomena, and strong sensations in the area or radiating where any reported pain 
uh, has been described by the patient. These are all thought to be good things and it makes for a fairly uncomfortable um, experience for a patient which uh, many of you might have experienced trigger point needling and I think I don't find many people that disagree with the fact that there is a fairly high degree of discomfort. Now <clears throat> because these were developed by I'm pretty sure Chan Gunn is actually a scientist rather than a medical practitioner although I'm happy to be corrected and Janet Travell was a doctor. Uh, these people are not, they don't have a strong background in assessing movement and movement dysfunction. So basically the um, reassessment with those approaches is does that feel better and does the point feel less sensitive and I'm not sure that's so, in, so interesting for us as physiotherapists that want to really change how people move. So uh, there's a focus in those trigger point approaches on reproducing the exact discomfort the subject's seeking treatment for. So if someone comes in and says I've got pain uh, in my backside radiating down my leg and if the needling actually reproduces the sensation, that's thought to be a, a, thought to be a good thing for those folks practicing those techniques. Um, there's also, I, in my early days, needling, so my, my own background as a needler was uh, a physiotherapist, decided I wanted to stick some needles in, so at that time we had to go and do the physiotherapy traditional acupuncture course, which I did, uh, and I started sticking needles in people. There were some trigger point needling workshops around, half a day, three hours, uh, and I went and did whatever was available and, and became familiar with all, all the approaches that were out there. Um, and there's definitely a culture of one, one point treatments. Um, in the reference list, for those of you who have done the course, uh, there's an ref article by a sports physician from Victoria called Lisa Huguenin, and she runs courses which used to be three hours, and she had trouble when, um, when, when the minimum standard for dry needling courses in Australia was extended to 16 hours. She had trouble padding that out. She said she had trouble padding out three hours. And her treatments were typically one and on special occasions like uh, wedding anniversaries and birthdays, uh, she would extend the treatment to two needles. Um, again, for those of you who are already familiar with the integrated dry needling, we're more likely to be using 20 to 30 needles. Okay. Uh, trigger point needling typically is a deeper insertion going through all the fascia, through all the layers, and there's a strong achy sensation. It's thought that a cramping of the muscle is desirable and strong spreading uh, sensation ideally covering the site of the reported pain is thought to be good or very uncomfortable. Why has it been popular? Well, you don't have to be a musculoskeletal expert to learn it. You prod, the person screws up their face and you jam the needle into the spot. You twist and jiggle and turn and fiddle around with the needle until the muscle gets so irritated it contracts. <clears throat> Anyone can learn it quickly. You don't even have to be a health professional, I don't think, to uh, practice it. But um, it's quickly adopted. People can start using it. And, you know, uh, doctors, sports physicians, etc. they enjoyed it because they didn't have to be skilled assessors of movement. They didn't have to have good palpation skills. It's incredibly simple. So typically, works on the idea that any musculoskeletal pain is because of overload due to shortened muscles. We needle them, the muscle cramps, the muscle then relaxes, and then we stretch the heck out of it. Uh, so that's a, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty brutal summary, but uh, you know, it sticks. You read, this, you read the thickest books on trigger point needling and you'll find there's nothing there that's inaccurate. Okay. Um, because it is picked up quickly and easily, uh, there's a lot of people doing it. And there are two very similar approaches. So you've got some people go to one, some, some people go to the other around the world, and they're all doing pretty much the same thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> although I personally never, never use it, the people using it will see that if they're working with professional footballers of any code, if they're working on army bases, treating 18 to 35-year-old males, um, and basically fit young people, females included, they'll find that this very local approach can, can be quite useful. Uh, in presentations where the, where the trigger points, and I'll put those in inverted commas, there's a recent article in the Journal of Rheumatology that actually says there's, 
no one can actually reliably find them, and it's very poor inter tester and inter, inter rate of reliability with uh, trigger point location. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll refer to them for now anyway. Uh, if someone says, look, I uh, cooled down after football, I felt this twinge in my butt, and now the pain's in my butt. Uh, if the trigger point need lab decides that there are trigger points in piriformis and gets piriformis dysplasm, in a young, fit person, that may that's more likely to get them a result. Now, when when in an integrated trineedling course, there will we learn a lot of ways to change how that um, piriformis muscle is actually behaving and the level of stress it's under, and it doesn't actually involve directly needling it. Like we look, we're more interested in looking at why the muscle had that stress reaction in the first place, and we use use our needs in other places. But um, this very simple direct approach. It's not completely useless, um, but people that people that do these courses and practice these approaches, they often start trigger point needling everyone that they see, and very quickly they'll find that outside that group of young fit people, it sort of has diminishing returns. You know, the the 55 year old. Uh, female who has chronic headaches, who has had a history of rotator cuff impingement, who has had a carpal tunnel operation on the other side, uh, who sits hunched at a computer. These people don't respond well, generally, to a trigger point reproach. Um, Multi-segmental sensitization, which drives the trigger point activity. You very often find uh, that there is more than one contributing uh, level of the spine or spine and contributing joints that drive muscle irritation, palpable muscle irritation, and trying to nail it with one or two strong cramp stimulating techniques is, is a fairly poor way to address it and results are generally poor. Um, systemically unwell patients, which some of you might see a lot of, and multiple diffuse sites of pain. And I'll just add in there too, people with a, a a pretty pure trigger point approach do very poorly generally with hypermobile people because what they'll be finding is there are palpable stress reactions in the muscle bellies of muscles that are stressed because they're in a lengthened position. They're outside the comfort zone, they're working in inefficient positions. Those muscles don't do well with direct needling. Uh, and, and so quite a common question that I'm asked by trigger point people is, how do you treat hypermobile people? And what we'll tend to do is we'll find out, even in the most hypermobile person, you'll find that they have some specific hypomobility. So someone, people are never hypermobile head to toe. They, if they're engaging in an activity like gymnastics or they're breaststroke swimmers, they will have developed specific compensatory movements so that something's not moving somewhere and that's contributing to the overload of the tissue. Uh, trigger point needles will be focusing on the overloaded tissue. We in integrated need, dry needling will be focusing on the tissue that's causing the overload. So it's quite a different approach. What are the limitations of those of trigger point needling uh, approaches? There are, if there are no trigger point presents, what do you do? Well, generally someone with a trigger point training starts doing trigger point technique anyway. And uh, that, that can lead to over-treatment, it can lead to people feeling faint, it can lead to people feeling unwell, sweaty, going pale. Uh, it can lead to muscles spasming up and cramping up. Uh, muscles that were already irritated find the irritation of the needle, um, if it's not 100% appropriate, to be enough to cause the muscle to actually go into a spasm. Muscle twitch and needle grasp responses are they're uncomfortable. You think about it, who likes having a cramp? That's what a muscle, that's what a trigger point technique feels like. There's a high degree of discomfort. Now, those of you that have done integrated dry needling courses, uh, Zimelda and Lara, uh, and there may be others of you out there, will know that it's not pain free or painless. There is a degree of discomfort. But if you compare the approaches, integrated dry needling is a walk in the park. It's, it's very much up the gentle end of the spectrum. And with the development of the approach, um, it was through some traditional acupuncturists uh, practicing a type of Japanese traditional acupuncture. I saw them putting needles in so that they were, you know, if the person 
I mean, the needles were in cough, they fell out on the floor, they were hardly in at all. And I wouldn't say that uh, I jumped all over that and thought that's a great way to practice musculoskeletal needling, but I definitely thought it's worth exploring how little can we do and still get measurable changes in range and measurable changes in functional tests. Um, and so what we do in integrated dry needling is considerably, uh, what we say, amped up, considerably sterner needle stimulation than those um, butterfly kiss type needling techniques used in that particular traditional response, uh, traditional approach, but, but nowhere near uh, trigger point needling. In, in the books and articles written by Baldry, Gunn and Travell, who are the main proponents of the, the myofascial trigger point release approaches, they all agree that 40% of people don't respond. Now, I would like to reframe that and say 40% of people, for 40% of people, that level of stimulation from a needle is too much and inappropriate and the system can't, can't respond. It's like an inappropriate dose. Um, and if the dose is adapt, adapted, I'm not sure. I would really like to do some research because I think everyone will respond if the level of needle stimulation is appropriate for that person's system, tissue, etc. Lisa Huguenin in her lit review said a third of people feel hot and sweaty and treatment should be discontinued. Okay, so 40 per four, 4 out of 10 people were not going to respond anyway. Uh, let's say we take the six responders, a third of them are going to feel hot and sweaty and treatment should be discontinued. So in my early days of needling, I really wasn't satisfied uh, that the the approaches I'd learned were useful enough to use all day every day in the clinic and started to look for other ways to use needles, which has been developed and, and refined and become integrated dry needling. Um, that's not to say, I mean, what kept me personally needling was there are times that needles, which do something that your hands don't and affect the nervous system in quite a different way in many cases, sometimes you have jaw dropping effects that you know you couldn't achieve with your hands. I saw enough of those to keep me needling and keep looking for a way to find needling uh, to have a wider application because really 40% of people not responding and a third feeling hot and sweaty and treatment needing to be discontinued just isn't good enough. And it's horribly pain based. Show me your pain. Is that the pain? Let me put the needle in the pain and twist it. Let me give you some more pain. Right. Now, how is that pain? So for those of you who are interested in treating brain drive and its contribution to pain experience, that constant focus on pain and discomfort is, is I think, a real shortcoming of the approach. We're trying to get people to form new neuro tags. We're trying to let unhelpful pain experience related neuro tags become redundant and constantly focusing people on that side of discomfort um, is, is not a clever step. So in integrated dry needling, we're constantly focusing on non-provocative resistance one range of movement. Okay, so the examination is non-provocative. Yeah, so here we go. Here's just a little slide. If we got a light bulb, and this is a, one of the trendy sort of eco light bulbs that not everyone might recognize straight away as a light bulb. Light bulb doesn't work. Trigger point needling is the equivalent of basically replacing it, <laughs> replacing it, not hitting it with a hammer, but it's very direct. Light bulb doesn't work, let's replace the light bulb. What do we do if that doesn't work? What integrated dry needling is more interesting is all the other things in the circuit that can lead to the light bulb not working. And there are many, aren't there? I mean, if we've had rats chewing the wires or if water's got into the wires, if the switch is not working, if the switch in, switchboard into the house is not working, or actually the power into the house or the power into the town. There's a lot of reasons that might not work. And we're going to do much better with more of our light bulbs if we consider them all, rather than just go straight to the light bulb and scratch our head and say, well, it was a non-responder. We replaced it, it was a non-responder. Okay. This is a fairly old concept, but I used to call, and this might be insulting you, orangutans. I used to call trigger point needling orangutan on acupuncture because I really think you could teach one of these guys to do it very, very quickly. Very low, it's a low context approach. We're uh, musculoskeletal professionals. We are the experts in tissue and movement. Uh, 
And if we don't feel particularly expert, then we can always, as of right now, start becoming more expert. But if someone comes and says, I hurt here, I feel tight, and you say, you grab them and push, and they say, yes, I feel tight, and then you drive a needle in there, do you really need to be an expert of any sort to do that? So uh, we've got a nice, interesting, flexible, versatile approach to needling. So let's talk about integrated dry needling now. Loosely, I would define it as when needling anomalies in tissue identified by range of motion testing and palpation, and we want to elicit changes in these anomalies and as a consequence in tissue physiology. So we palpate irritated tissue, we might palpate irritated muscle bellies. We'll palpate thickenings and structural adaptation in our ligaments and our tendonomuscular junctions and our uh, tendonoperiosteal insertions. They are changes in the body in response to abnormal loading over time. And we can reverse, we can stimulate reversal, we can uh, immediately modulate or modify the neural outflow that's related to these changes and stress responses. And that provides us with all sorts of things. It provides us with a window for retraining. So if we, if we modify or modulate or debug neural activity, getting rid of inhibition, allowing better quality um, neurophysiological outflow from the spine, then we've got a window there where we can train quality movement. We're very interested not just in stimulating instant change with needles, but in working out why that situation existed. And then it's our macro management. It's our big measure. Why is that tissue stressed like that anyway? Is it because the person's hunched over the computer or they've got an awful swimming stroke? Or uh, is it the runner with constant hip and knee problems because they lack any sort of thoracic rotation? Um, those are the non-needling sides of things that we need to identify. We can then use needling to help restore those movement, remove movement barriers, uh, and then we need to manage. We need to take take on our role as coaches and teachers of movement so that our changes remain changed. Um, a very common question people who haven't done any needling will ask is, how long does needling, do the effects of needling last for? And I'll say that I'm a very bad person to answer that because I never just needle and I never have just needled, I'll always, there'll always be some macro management. So changing of someone's technique, changing of their posture, there'll be some taping, there might be changes of their office setup, there might be changes of their bike setup. Uh, everything you're doing is trying to promote uh, a sustaining of the effects that you've been able to achieve with needling. Okay. There's a lot off that slide, hey? Okay, it's a freestyle system of needling. There's no book of points. I wish there was. It'd be something to sell. Uh, so many people have got those Travell and, Travell and Simons books in their office. I wish we could have integrated dry needling points. But the thing is, if I treat you today and I give you good advice about your technique, the way you treat around a table and your tennis serve or your um, swimming stroke, when I meet up with you in 10 days or two weeks or a month or whenever we decide we should meet again, I should be looking at a different body. What I should be needling should be different. I will have stimulated change in your body with needles. We will have restored to some extent your ranges and then taught you to drive your body differently. So your points, where we're sticking the nails, they'll change over, over a series of treatments. <coughs> It's not really a fusion of Japanese meridian therapy, but as I mentioned before, that was my first, all the needling I'd seen and experienced in courses and workshops was heavy. It was a Japanese meridian therapist I saw doing light needling, and whilst I'll say it's a fantastic sort of branch of acupuncture, it's really not useful for musculoskeletal issues. Uh, you don't get up with an improved straight leg raise after a meridian therapy treatment. Um, so we, we basically, are doing an upregulated, a ramped up version of needling. Okay. We actually, it's a flexible system where if we have 10 people with left lateral hip pain and they run, we actually might be treating shoulder girdle on the opposite side in some of those people. We might be treating thoracic spine in some of those people to change how they run. Um, we might actually be treating lumbar spine and posterior hip capsule in some, and we might actually be treating femoral nerve pathway uh, in, in 
some to change and improve their ability to do a single leg stance to improve running drills and basically run with a better technique that doesn't overload their lateral hip. So um, we have to individualise our treatment based on their individual musculoskeletal assessment and screening. <clears throat> we confirm, you know, you, uh, you might observe a restricted straight leg raise in a in a patient, you don't necessarily, that doesn't tell you where to stick your needles, you need to then palpate in the appropriate areas to find where in the tissue you need to needle. Okay, I needle everybody, uh, not everybody that's done integrated needling will needle everybody, uh, but it definitely, if you get good at this particular approach of dry needling, it has the capacity to reduce maybe 95% of your manual therapy. I still do a little bit of manual therapy every day, uh, I do a little bit of manual therapy with every patient. I'm constantly working to do less. Uh, I still want to do less, but there are some things. I will say that needling first makes all the manual therapy techniques work better, or you need to do less actual manual therapy to achieve your result. But there are some things that I haven't yet managed to achieve with needles that I still need to do with my hands. But basically, you can reduce a lot of the hard work that we as manual therapists do. Okay, in terms of the rest of the examination, um, R1 testing is, is it's got a lot of pluses. One of, the, one of them is it's always non-provocative. It doesn't matter how irritated your person is, R1 will happen before it provokes pain. Uh, and that's how you work out very, very quickly is someone's right shoulder girdle like contributing abnormal impulses, AIGS, David Butler term. Um, contributing abnormal impulses to the system that's helping contribute to that left lateral hip bursitis, for example. Uh, it tells us which specific areas of the spine we need to needle. Uh, if you go and do a trigger point needling course, you'll find you learn one needling technique. Uh, we actually start off on level one with four and we add in single point releases and um, a number of variations on the themes in level two. So we actually have different ways of using needles. When people ask me the question, what do the needles do? I'll actually draw their attention to the fact that within their one treatment, within their 15 needles that are inserted into them, there are actually needles that are interconnective tissue. There are needles that are through their skin, but not through their fascia. There are needles that are doing other things, that they're actually experiencing three different techniques within their treatment, and all of those techniques are doing something different. Okay, our, our, our main aim is to change movement. We, we should be treating mechanical pain, and if pain is mechanical and we change the movement, then we should change the pain. Okay, it's a big focus on the t on tissue that is not moving. Um, tissue that's not moving will tend to inhibit tissue, other tissue, uh, switch off. For example, <clears throat> you see a VMO not moving, you don't get a VMO going with needling by sticking a needle in VMO. You generally, it depends, you might be needling the opposite hip capsule posteriorly, you might be needling anterior areas of the lumbar spine, you might be needling the femoral nerve pathway, but you won't be needling VMO. You'll be needling the things, the structures that are inhibiting VMO. So one of the main one of the main uh, mechanisms behind this approach to dry needling is disinhibition. Okay, and basically we're aiming to change the way that person moves. And if we normalise or optimise, or and and achieve a better level of functionality in the way someone moves, we will deal with their mechanical pain. So it's an indirect response, uh, an indirect approach. Uh, it's a it's a long way along from here's my pain. Right, boom, we'll whack a needle into it. Okay. Now, we need to be skilled movement assessors, and we, we start working on that on the course. For a lot of people, R1 range testing is new, um, but it's a good thing to have up your sleeve. We tend to, to graduate with a pain provocative examination. I know if I go for a treatment, I don't really want the person treating me to reproduce my pain. If they can work out what's wrong with me and give me a good treatment without doing that, I'd, I'd very, be very happy for that to happen. Um, very often our palpation isn't, isn't emphasised in, in our training and our palpation tends to um, 
usually involve us pushing deeply into the tissue until someone screams or says, yes, that's it. There's a lot more information in tissue about tissue load, how long, how intense the loading's been, that we can get without having people jumping through the roof. Um, despite that, people still tell me I'm pushing too hard on a daily basis, but I'm happy for my hands' sake and the fact that I'm very lazy and I don't like to work hard, that I know I'm not actually pushing as hard as I perhaps would have been in my very early years as a physio. Uh, we, we, we talk a little, uh, or we, what I'll say is, your appreciation for that person's tissue and that person's system for the, for the relative amount of tissue irritation versus the relative amount of tissue restriction lets you build a highly individualised treatment that is appropriate for that person. So we have highly customised treatments, there's no recipes in what we do. Okay. Uh, we don't need trigger points, we look for lots of other tissue changes, we don't need the, the muscles to cramp, to think we've done a good job, and we're not really interested, although people will get up and say, oh, that feels better, oh, jeez, I couldn't, uh, geez, my shoulder was nipping when I was putting my jumper on. We're not actually that interested in, does that feel better, does that feel better, does that feel better? If our internal rotation of the shoulder test has changed, if the upper limb tension test is now rather than being minus 30 to R1, if we've got a full, a full, um, full snappy elbow extension on your upper limb tension test one. If our straight leg raise has gone from 15 degrees to 40 degrees, that's what we're. That's how we know we've, we've uh, been effective, and that's how we know that, that person is going to move differently. Okay. Uh, on level one, we we don't really we've got to learn to needle, so we don't tend to look at how someone single leg stands or runs or hops. But on level two, we do start looking at that. Um, level one, we're looking at changing our passive range testing on the bed. Uh, and we're looking at tissue irritability assessment, which we use our standard tests, but we're looking at them slightly differently. And that looks like the end of the show. What a, what a shock. Okay, now I need to find out how to get back to us for questions. So we've got me live, we've got my slightly end of the day, day face looking, uh, looking at you all. Lovely. Okay, so questions, guys. Um, Lara, good. 95% of your patients, fantastic. 25% more, and you're in the big leagues. Everybody, 100% of your patients. Keep going, that's great. Uh, now, 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 now. Now, I see Dave has asked Lara a question in the chat room. Uh, Dave, if you're out there, am I expecting to see the questions come up on the, on the chat room there? Um, Helen's asked, is it normal for soreness the next day? Um, that's a good question, Helen. Trigger point needlers do cause a lot of local soreness, and there's one particular trigger point needling course uh, in Australia that tells its students to leave seven to ten days between the treatment because of the internal tissue damage and the soreness. Uh, we make people sore. I'll just give a little side on it. I spent a lot of time in this position, and after needling and a bit of uh, teaching, I'm spending time in this position. Some of my tissues that were compressed are now distracted. Some that were distracted are now compressed. I've got joint surfaces taking load that we were taking load before, and I'm going to feel sore, but it's not sore because of needling. We don't get soreness at the site of needling. We get soreness or because of new or modified tissue load. So thanks for that question, Helen. It's a very, it's a very common question. Uh, Joe has asked uh, about needling around the neck. Yes, yes. Uh, on level one, we look, we needle the periphery, um, and really, really, um, it's really safe. For example, to needle the lumbar spine. So lumbar spine is a little bit more delicate, but I don't include lumbar spine on level one because you don't treat lumbar spine pain by sticking needles in the lumbar spine. It's part of the treatment, but it's finishing touches. Most of your work is done elsewhere. Um, so yes, needle around the neck, a lot of anterior work, a lot of posterior work. And that's, that's all covered on level two. So thanks for that, Joe. Uh, Liz, I take it, Dave, I'm just, uh, just going through this list here. So Liz has asked to swab the skin prior to needle insertion. Um, I'm not sure, Liz, if, where you're from, but if you're familiar with the uh, 
ASA peer guidelines for, for primary and acupuncture. Um, they'll say that swabbing is not necessary, although uh, I, I, the line from the guidelines, and that you can go to my website, uh, drawneedling.com.au, and you'll see a link there to download a copy of the guidelines that are freely available. Uh, it'll say that swabbing of the skin um, if, is not necessary if the skin appears clean. That's pretty much what how doctors operate for injections. In fact, uh, the Australian Immunisation Handbook was the reference for, for that. Um, however, when we Nearly into joints, and if you've got someone that's immunocompromised, then we do actually not only alcohol swab, we actually have to sterilise the chlorhexidine. Okay, okay, so there's actually no role for alcohol swabs in your in your brain practice. Uh, it's either no swabs or you sterilise. Thanks, Liz, for that question. So, gee, Casey's asked. Um, it's a big question, Casey. How can needling be effectively used around the hip and how can it refer to pain? Now, there's, there's, um, it's a big question because if we took the example of 10 people complaining of hip pain, like I talked about, then some of those people will require that hip. Um, that, or might, might test with restricted range on that here. And all the things that go along with it, the gluteal inhibition, the, the TA inhibition. Um, somebody else complaining of exactly that same pain may actually display none of that on the side of the pain, but might display it on the opposite side. Some of those people might present with significant lumbar spine restriction, or and, and the others might respond with thoracic spine restriction. Calf tightness. It depends. It depends what your findings are. You treat those with needle in this approach. Uh, what I'll just say there, Casey, just to finish answering your question is: someone comes and points to their hip and says, "I hurt here when I run." You know, there will be some people that will stick needles in that. We know people love to inject that spot. It's the diagnosis. It's the itis. But we're interested in the why. Why did that spot become inflamed? Why did it develop an apathy? Why is that pain sensitive? And we're going to use our needles to treat that perhaps ankle stiffness, that uh, calf that, that is uh, restricted, or calf and hamstring that are, that are resulting in restricted straight leg raise and abnormal internal rotation of the hip. We're going to use our needles there to treat the overload that's resulting in hip pain. So we've got to start thinking differently to how do I treat lateral ankle pain? Uh, thinking that we're going to be sticking needles in the lateral ankle. So thanks for that, Casey. It's, it's, a, it's a big question, but it's really all about how we treat two. Uh, Aaron's asked, uh, he's been taught there's no evidence to support cleaning the area prior to needling, or that it reduces the risk of infection. And that, that um, essentially, Aaron, you're saying what I've said, which is in the guidelines. Um, I don't know about no evidence. I think. Um, People that are very involved with infection would be able to throw up lots of articles, but at the moment, the guidelines are satisfied that with the information available, it's not necessary to swab to swab prior to me. Uh, okay, yeah. do I have a way of highlighting these, Dave, or are you highlighting these? Uh, what have we got? Uh, Lara's question. Now, Lara, is that a question? Can you frame that question a little better? You've just got thoracic and anterior cervical spine. Uh, can you perhaps pad that out and turn it into a question? And I'll come back to you. Um, Amy's asked, what about strange autonomic responses? It's something we talk about all needling. In fact, uh, some of you might have uh, already experienced with non-needling treatments that people can have autonomic responses. Um, often to the story on courses that Basically, people will attribute anything to, like for, for a lot of people, a needling treatment will be the most exciting or unusual or newest input that they've had into their systems in the last period of time. So I've been asked um, about, could, I've been having lots of bad dreams could that be because of the needle we did last time. I've been fighting a lot with my partner, is that because of uh, the needling you did? Um, I was actually called. I was out fishing one day and I was called seven missed calls. And I found the person back. I've been hearing dogs barking at the ear. 
with that the treatment you did, which I think was sort of nothing north of maybe maybe the thoracic lumbar junction. Well, my first my first response was was there a dog barking? Uh, it turned out to be something quite different. And not really. People often focus on the moving. There are some people from some people feel faint, some people feel lightheaded, particularly with. Um, now, I've, I've looked for references here. When you treat with or without needles in the thoracic area, people might feel a little emotional. They might feel angry and agitated. They might feel teary and labile. Um, any of these things are possible. We are actually providing a different input to the system. And depends. I think it depends how, how close to uh, snapping points, not the word, but how sympathetically loaded or how out of balance that person's autonomic system is, needling might be just another input that actually um, that actually stimulates a weird autonomic response. But it can happen with manual therapy treatments too. Uh, definitely not just needling and uh, some of you have really experienced that. So thank you. Good question. Um, well, oh. Okay, good. Hang on, where are we? Uh, skin, no evidence, thoracic. Ah, oh, thanks, Lara. So that wasn't a question. Dave's just clarified that that's where you get good results in, and I'm glad to hear that. Amy, stranger. Okay, Liz Holt, I'm from New Zealand. Hands just swabbing here. That's fine. Um, that's okay. We're in Australia. We go with the Australian guidelines. The course has been presented in New Zealand. I always direct New Zealand practitioners to the hands guidelines. So thanks, Liz, for that. Um, where are we? Thomas. Okay. This is similar to how he was kneeling around the hip. Thomas has asked about, uh, I guess it's dry needlings or integrated dry needlings. So from now on, I'm pretty much talking about integrated dry needling the way I practice all day and have been practicing and teaching since 1992. Um, that it's very effective for specific tendon and neural conditions. And it all comes down to screen the body, work out what's not moving, work out what's irritated and contributing to eye blow, and treat that with needles. So again, we have 10 people with Achilles tendinopathy, Achilles tendinitis, or, and we'll get 10 different screenings, and some of those people will be needling to change their straight leg growth. Some of them will be needling to change their hip internal rotation, lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and we'll have a test. If they're a runner, we're interested in how they perform running drills. If they're a swimmer, we're interested in how they swim. Here, here in my practice, and I have two iPads and I have a tripod, uh, and every day patients are sending me video of them swimming after we're treated. If, if I've changed someone's hip rotation, that needs to make a difference to how they swim and I'm going to see it. So I don't have a swimming pool here in my practice, so I get them to go to the pool, get videoed swimming, and shoot that through to me. Because we need to see how we meaningfully alter their activity. So yes, great for neural conditions and tendon problems, treatment every day, uh, every day in the clinic, and it's a great tool. How do we want to repeat the needles in situ? Color, it depends. Um, some of the needle techniques need to stay in for up to 10 minutes, and some work, pop them in, pop them out. They work on spinal reflexes, and so they can essentially go in and go out. Um, Hamish, hello. Uh, Hamish has just made the comment. Can everybody see these comments, Dave? Um, Hamish just said, good work for what you're doing and the way you're approaching needle and physio. Thanks, Hamish. And David says, thanks, Hamish. Uh, what do you need to be aware of when needling the neck, Andrew, Joe? That's a good question, but it's a big question. What do you think's in the neck? What don't we want to needle? So you can't be too vague. You need to have good palpation skills and good control of the needle. Uh, one of the old slides from the very old, very unrefined versions of the course back in the early 90s was, if it pulses, don't needle it. And if you don't know what it is you're sticking a needle into, don't do it. Okay, I'll leave it there, Joe. Obviously, you have to learn how to needle the neck. Um, Casey, yes, Casey's asked about having had good results with needling cervicogenic headaches. Yes, indeed. Um, basically, you also, yes, um, what you're trying to do is some people with cervicogenic headache they have specific immobility, they have joints that are behaving stiff or exhibiting immobility. 
Uh, very often, you can look at shoulder girdle, cervical thoracic junction, occipital region, thoracic spine, and the address, anything that's not moving is moving. As a result, people will be disinhibited. They'll actually be able to work their deep neck flexors better than they were before, and we'll give them postural cues, or training, etc., etc., etc. But the big answer is yes, good results for cervical genital. Have you treated anyone? Aaron's asked the question that comes up on every course. Uh, have you needed anyone with CRPS? And so did they respond well? That's a great question. And the way I answer that, and we can answer any of these, are you good at treating CRPS without needles? If you are, and you learn a nice, gentle, non-provocative examination and needling approach, then yes. CRPS is a great tool in your hands. If you are terrible at treating CRPS, if your if your uh, skills, at the way to dialogue and educate a patient, the way to handle them, the way to guide them through the opportunity to form new neurotags and quieten down their their upregulated brain drive, um, don't think that a few a handful of needles is going to be the answer for those people. So. So just to summarise there, if you already are confident and feel you've got a very good CRPS treatment act going, uh, as a skilled needler, particularly with integrated needling, I don't think true point needling has anything to offer. You can use needles. Needles are a, once you're skilled, they're a fairly specific, fairly well measured dosage of sensory input that you can increase incrementally. Um, and so with skill, your input, your level of input becomes quite consistent. You can actually focus people on movement changes and tissue irritation changes that have happened with no discomfort. There have been no heavy manual techniques. You can start to focus them on movement changes, focus of, taking the focus away from pain sensation, which has, has a quietening down um, the central outflow effect. So yes, CRPS, yes, if you're good at it, needles can be used in it. If you're not good at it, needles aren't the answer. Full stop. Thanks, Aaron. That's a good question. Amy's asked about runners and calf tightness. How quickly can they return to running and why do the calf seem to respond so strongly to needling? Well, I wouldn't agree that all calves seem to respond so strongly to needling. I did uh, I did a presentation last week at Athletics Club down here in Tasmania, and I followed that up with uh, video analysis of running. Uh, I did 16 analyses, and two of those people had long-term calf tightness, uh, which had been dry needed elsewhere, not responding. Those people need to learn to run. The calves get overloaded by their lack of control, lack of awareness, and their specific restrictions in other parts of their body. Their symptom is their calf, and they don't respond. Some calves will. Um, I can't say why calves seem to respond. If I, I seem to see quite a lot of people in my clinic who have not responded. So um, I would say of the calves that I've seen in the last four weeks, a lot of them have been needed and not responded. In my feeling, is generally the reason for the experience or exhibition of calf tightness, measured or reported, is calves are overworking or being moved in a way they weren't meant to because elsewhere is overloading them. That's what they've got to treat. So runners and calf tightness, yes. How quickly can they return to running? That's a management question. You need to have, uh, once you've worked out why the calves are tight, you can then say, well, look, uh, you need to be able to achieve this level of motor control because that's what you need with running and to run, and once they can achieve that level of motor control, they can run. Thanks, Andy, for that question. Okay, uh, David's put up the any last questions uh, question. Any last questions? Um, probably bring that to an end. Uh, as you can see, you know, my approach to physio is work out why the thing's sore. Don't, don't treat it symptomatically. Sticking needles in the sore spot is not what, not what I practice, not what I teach. It is very nice to be a practitioner that can make the difference where people have failed, like people have had the calves needle, the calves feel tight, they've not done well. If you can be the one that uh, gets a real result with that person, you need a wider, more flexible model of treatment, not just of needling. So integrated dry needling, it's a, it's a flexible model. It's a global model. It's an indirect model of needling.
So I think so. oh we've got another one, Carla. Ah no, there's no such Carla's Carla said, sorry if this is a silly question, there's no 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 such thing ever as a silly question or a dumb question. What do you aim to me with not aiming at the trigger point? Carla, I'd encourage you between now and when you do some do a training. Uh, we all know that somebody who sits at a computer like this has got trigger points in elevator scaffold up a traps. Okay. What we need to do, and it's uh, is see that as a symptom or as a result, assess that person and find out is it restricted shoulder? Is it restricted cervical spine? Is it restricted OC wrong range? What is actually causing elevator scap to have that uh, to produce that symptom? And that's needle to change movement there. And look, it's a four day course. Um, you've got to know a bit, you've got to do a bit. It's actually a, a another two days. So some people do six days training. There's a lot to it. You can't just say upper 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 traps tightness, upper traps three points, stick the needle in this spot. Otherwise we could just write a book and it'd be easy. Do this spot on the recipe. It has to be individualized. Depends on the body in front of you. Thanks Carla. Okay, guys, Michael, hello. See you in Tasmania. Uh, <laughs> thanks Liz. Thanks Aaron. Uh, I feel like I've said a lot of words in a short time. I hope, uh, I hope everyone's been able to catch them all. And I hope you can see that tight calves in a runner, a sore hip in a runner. You've got to work out why it's sore before you do anything, whether it's manual work or needling. Okay? Whacking needles in the sore spot, not the way forward. Okay. Uh, anything else? David, anyone else? Let's move off. Hmm. 